If two murderous poachers wounded you and trapped you in the crawl space of an isolated cabin, what would you do? Wholesome family man Robert lives month to month as a septic tank plumber in a tiny Oregon town, trying to do the right thing in a town full of people who take advantage of him. That is, until he watches two criminals gun down his customer and gets trapped with a bundle of cash in a cabin's crawl space. It's only a matter of time before they get inside and finish Robert off. Let's see if we can make it out alive. I'm going to break down Robert's mistakes try to make better decisions and ultimately attempt to feed the timber poachers in crawl space. Timber poachers work to fell a massive tree and then transport it to a local timber yard and reduce it to lumber. After the lumber is sold, the Russian truck driver returns to the mill for his paycheck, a massive Ziploc bag full of oxy pills. As his boss drives away, another truck pulls up. The Russian is ripped out of the cab by the fat, strong arms of a masked bandit named Dooley, who beats him mercilessly while another masked bandit looks on. When the Russian insults the bandit's mother, a bandit named Sterling, unmasks himself and shoots the driver in the chest. Dooley grabs the driver's bag of pills, but seems disappointed that that's all they find. Nearby, the mill owner, Tim Whitner, stashes a duffel bag full of cash in a far corner of the crawl space under his isolated cabin. We cut to a family man, Robert, a quintessential good guy who works as a local plumber. He takes a call from a client who claims he can't afford payments. Pushover Robert offers to let him pay in installments. Outside Side, Robert's truck barely starts. While springing for 10 bucks of gas, he laments his situation to Sheriff Higgin and Deputy Jordan, who try to reassure him good guys can come out on top he doesn't believe him. Robert drives deep into the forest. His truck dies on the unpaved road, so he hoofs it the remaining half mile to Tim Whitner's cabin. He moves his equipment around to the back of the cabin and gears up to enter the crawl space with a mask and a headlamp. Nearby, Tim Whitner has a run-in with Dooley and Sterling on his morning jog. Sterling pulls his revolver and kidnaps him. As we've seen with Robert at home and the police at the gas station, this town is small, like everyone knows your name and business small. Everyone trusts each other and no one is willing to assume the worst. Whitner knows better. He's moonlighting as a timber poacher, using his own lumber mill to cut and distribute the illegal wood. If caught, he'd be looking at fines, small amounts of jail time and penalties for his business. The bigger danger is that he's paying his lackeys in oxycotton pills. Oregon has recently passed a measure that reduces the possession of 40 pills of Oxycontin to a civil violation with no jail time and a hundred dollar fine. But this is thousands of pills. With a Schedule II drug like Oxycontin, he would be looking at possession, distribution, and manufacturing charges, with each carrying a prison sentence of up to 10 years. That's all to say Widner is breaking the law while breaking the law. No one's coming to his rescue, and he can't trust anyone who knows what he's up to. When he jogs around this bend in the road, the moment he sees two masked men, he should bolt into the forest and either direction. Even if it takes a moment to realize that they're wearing masks, he should run the moment he sees the gun sticking out of Sterling's pants. There's no need to engage or listen to a word that they have to say. You're a criminal doing criminal things, and so are they. Only one of them is physically fit enough to chase you, but this forest is thick enough to quickly disappear behind trees and over hills long before Sterling can catch up. Sheriff Higgin and Deputy Jordan arrive to a section of the forest where massive trees have been clear cut. They're met by FBI agent Masur, who tells them that even even though it's not as flashy or serious sounding as drugs, guns, or murder, poaching old growth timber is an organized criminal activity that costs the United States $2 trillion in losses annually. Just beyond a ridge, Masur's men find a dead body. Back in the crawl space, Robert eventually reaches the corner of the cabin with access to the plumbing. He cranks some tunes on his headphones and gets to work. Unheard above him, Dooley and Sterling kick Whitner around his own cabin. They want to know where he stashed the illegal timber money. When he feigns ignorance, Sterling unmasks himself, and Dooley breaks a few of Whitner's teeth. With Whitner not giving up the stash, Sterling sends Dooley to the truck to retrieve Bessie. While he's gone, Sterling postures while drinking and snorting one of the pills he stole from the Russian driver. Whitner rushes Sterling and Tyson's his ear off. He reaches for Sterling's revolver, but before he can turn it, Sterling stabs him in the eye with a pencil. The screaming finally reaches Robert, where he is in the crawl space. He watches through the floor grate as Sterling offers Whitner one last chance to tell them where the money is. Suddenly, Suddenly, Dooley enters with Bessie, a massive crossbow. When Whitner tries to rush Sterling again, Sterling shoots him dead, splattering Whitner's blood across Robert's face. Robert scrambles out of sight as Dooley and Sterling argue about how difficult it'll be to find the money if they kill everyone who can tell them where it is, which is reasonable. Sterling suddenly smiles and says he knows where the money is when he rolls Whitner's body aside and notices the grate in the floor. 
Winners wasted his home field advantage here, but we can't afford to, unless we want to end up as red face paint. Sterling is a hothead. He's unmasking himself as an intimidation factor, but also to tell us he's not letting us leave alive whether we let him have the money or not. So, we need to outthink him. He wants the cash we know is hidden under the house. So, if we're in Whitner's position, we have three options here. The first option is to tell him it's deep in the crawl space under the house, but that it's booby-trapped and only we know how to get it out. It's likely he would send us in to retrieve it while waiting outside, at which point we could just sit out of sight and wait for them to turn their backs before slamming and barricading the crawl space hatch, buying us time. Or, we could wait until Sterling sticks his head and gun through the crawl space hole to check on us, try to grab it, and disarm him. The second option is to tell them it's in the crawl space and see how they respond. If they take us with him to check, we can ambush one of them on the way around the house, or bolt into the woods. This is risky as both of them are armed, and there's two of them. Even if we can ambush one, we might not be able to stop the other from firing their weapon before they hurt or kill us. If only one goes alone, then we'll have to deal with the other who's left to watch us, by going for the pistol, the shotgun, or the crossbow, whichever is in range. The last option is to bluff by claiming the money is being kept elsewhere. In this case, you could claim that either someone else is holding the money and call for backup when they let you use the phone, or you could claim it's buried somewhere that's easy to escape, like a heavily treed area of the forest. When Whitner attacks Sterling, he gets Sterling on the ground, but goes for the gun prematurely. With Sterling on the ground, he should be beating his head against the floor to disorient, if not knock him out completely before reaching for the gun. Even if you reach for the gun, you should try to swing away from Sterling's body to put space between you and prevent immediate retaliation. As for Sterling and Dooley, this entire setup reminds us that they're just a couple of two-bit thugs without any real sense of strategy or preparation. Dooley's right when he says they're going to run out of people to interrogate if his hot-headed brother keeps killing them. Even if you think you know where they are, at least don't kill him until you actually have it. Besides that, they should have tied Whitner to a living room beam before asking any questions at all in the first place. In the crawl space, Robert stumbles over the duffel bag of cash. He tosses it aside and rushes for the exit. Outside, the bandits spot him. Dooley aims the crossbow and fires before Robert can react, nailing him in the shoulder. Robert scrambles back inside the crawl space while Sterling takes pot shots. Dooley charges the hatch before Robert can seal it and nearly yanks Robert out by his ankles, but Robert kicks Dooley back. Dooley stops the hatch from shutting again, so Robert pulls out his utility knife and slices Dooley's hand, then barricades the hatch with a wrench. Robert's in shock, so his hesitation here is understandable, even though it gets him shot with the crossbow. Honestly though, he probably shouldn't have left the crawl space at all. Dooley and Sterling have no reason to suspect he's in there. His truck isn't parked nearby, and he never entered the house nor left any sign of his presence outside. His best bet after finding the money would likely be to place the duffel bag just inside the hatch door, and then scramble for a far corner where he could hear their reaction to finding it when they open the hatch. Sterling and Dooley have just killed a guy. It's likely they just want to leave the area with the cash as soon as they find it, even if they decided to have a deeper look around. This crawl space is large enough to play keep away until they realize nothing else is down there and leave. Then, we just need to wait a few minutes and slip away into the forest. Even if they wanted to search the cabin again, we could just wait until they walked back around the house to go inside and then run for the forest. The point is, they have no reason to try and kill something they don't think is there. Presenting yourself to them like this is signing your own death certificate. They just killed a guy. They're not going to hesitate to kill you you too. If Robert chooses the crawl space for cover instead of bolting, he needs to duck back inside while Dooley's raising his crossbow to fire. Those precious seconds mean the difference between being strong and fit to fight and getting shot in the chest. Now wounded, our only recourse is to barricade this door. Grabbing the wrench is quick thinking on Robert's part, but it's not going to be enough. The police and FBI arrive to a private area where tracks suggest a full tree was hauled away. Agent Missour gets word about a body in the forest. It was the Russian truck driver. She asks about the nearest lumber mill. Debbie Jordan tells her it's Tim Whitner's place. Back at Whitner's, Dooley and Sterling have hunkered down in the kitchen and talk to Robert through the floor. He tells them he's just a plumber. Sterling's a nice guy and offers to let him go if he'll give them the money. Robert asks how he could ever trust them, considering he just shot a guy. Sterling reminds him that they can wait for him to die and then find a way down to the money. Dooley begs to go to the hospital for his hand, but the best Sterling can do is pour some bourbon on it. 
Fortunately, Robert has a couple options here. The first is the most obvious, but also the most likely to succeed. Since these bandits aren't smart enough to leave someone to guard the crawlspace hatch at all times, Robert should wait for Dooley and Sterling to start talking in the kitchen, and then remove the wrench barricading the hatch and run into the forest. By listening to their footsteps, Robert knows where they are in the house in relation to the exit, and he knows that to reach him, they have to come around the house, or look through the exact right window to spot him running away. He should use that blindness to his advantage, and leave before they get too desperate. Again, I'd leave the duffel bag of cash by the hatch door too, so they're distracted by it if they come around to the hatch again, giving me even more of a head start. The second option is to use this grate in the cabin floor and shove the duffel bag through it. This is dangerous, and they might not believe it's all the cash, but if they stuck around afterward, you would know with 100% certainty that they intend to kill you, and you could drop your good guy persona for the rest of the day. The third option is to use our cell phone to call the cops. As I've mentioned before in my video on The Visit, cell providers are required to let calls to emergency numbers go through, even if the phone claims there's no service. We later see Sterling make a call from this property, and Robert is almost able to call Carrie before the call drops, so he should be able to dial 911 and tell them where he is, even if a call won't pick up. Oregon 911 accepts text messages for emergencies. At the police station, Agent Masur tells Sheriff Higgin that Tim Whitner's finances suggest he's up to something criminal at his lumber mill. The sheriff doesn't buy it, and doesn't want to tarnish Whitner's reputation without hard evidence. The agent points out any wrongdoing would be carefully hidden, and the deputy agrees that they need to check out the agent's lead. Back in the crawl space, Robert prepares for surgery. He pulls a hacksaw from his toolbox and saws through the bolt shaft in his shoulder. He pulls the rest of the bolt through his body from behind, then he flicks on his welding torch and heats a circular metal tin until it's red hot to cauterize the wound entrance. Like I've told you before in my sweetheart video, if you're stabbed with an impaling object, leave it in. He may be cauterizing the outside of the front of the wound here, but it's clearly a through and through, and we never see him cauterize the back. He's also probably internally bleeding now too. Cutting off the ends of the bolt to make it easier to move around is a good idea, but then he should use his overshirt and the duct tape in his toolbox to wrap and secure the remaining bolt in place until it can be removed at a hospital. Agent Masur and Deputy Jordan arrive to the Whitner's lumber mill, where they question people. No one will talk. They even question Robert's wife, Carrie, who has arrived to pick up the part-time bookkeeping work for the mill that she can do from home. In Wintner's cabin, Sterling checks in on Robert, who's still alive. Sterling keeps him talking so he can hunt Robert across the cabin floor by listening for the sound of his voice. Robert tries calling Carrie, but the call fails. Sterling asks what Robert will need to feel comfortable. Robert suggests Sterling and Dooley should leave for an hour. He'll get out and leave the money behind. Not convinced by this option, Sterling fires through the floor, just missing Robert. Sterling calls out again, warning that he can outlast him. Robert makes a big mistake here by confirming for Sterling and Dooley that the money is down there with him. To this point, they had no clue where it was, but now they do, which means the target on our back just got a thousand times bigger. Robert really shouldn't be talking to them at all. All it does is confirm for him what we've known all along. The moment Sterling shoots through the floor, Robert knows they have no intention of letting him live. At that point, shut up, move to a different section of the crawl space, preferably one with concrete or metal supports between you and another barrage of bullets, and make other places. Plans. To be clear, Robert should leave. They're distracted. Sterling has to reload his weapon now that he's shot through the floor, so Robert should move to the hatch, open it silently, and go. At Widner's lumber mill, Deputy Jordan tells Agent Masur the mill's been open for 70 years. Carrie shows Masur some numbers, but when Masur says they don't add up, Carrie shuts down and says she needs to talk with Widner before she lets them look at everything. Before leaving, Agent Masur questions one more lumber worker named Gerald, who Deputy Jordan says is a a good kid who does a lot of dumb stuff. True to form, Gerald takes off running through the mill, forcing Agent Masur to chase him. He gets stopped short by the deputy who took a shortcut. The agent finds drugs on him. To get him to talk, Deputy Jordan calls his dad and tells him that Gerald's caught up in the usual. He folds like a lawn chair and admits he got the drugs from the Russian Vlad. Sterling gets high again and tells Dooley to find a way to break that hatch open. Dooley's too scared of Robert's knife, so Sterling hands him one of his own. Down below, it's Robert's turn to hunt. He listens as Sterling tries to bait him again, then takes a drill and burrows up right through Sterling's foot. Sterling opens fire, getting five shots off, then pulls his foot off the drill bit. Robert warns him not to fire the gun again, and Sterling fires. Robert sets 20 grand on fire and tosses it up through the floor grate. Sterling rushes to stomp it out, but his pant leg and boot catch on fire instead. Dooley smothers it with a blanket, while Robert laughs maniacally. We've reached the Straw Dogs, home alone portion of the story. It's great to see Robert having fun, thriving in his element of drilling into people's feet and setting money on fire. He deserves a little fun. 
course, in reality, he's risking getting shot seven ways to Sunday here for a high-risk, low-reward sort of petty revenge. Even if Sterling can't feel the drill coming up through the floor before it reaches his foot, he now knows where to fire to shoot you. You don't jump into a tiger's mouth just to flick its ears. Not if you want to survive anyways. Instead, Robert should use his paint-thinner covered money as a distraction he needs to finally get out of the crawl space and run into the woods. These bandits are here for the money. Tossing three or four bundles up would force them to waste time trying to put them out, splattering them in flaming paint thinner. While they're busy with that, rush for the hatch and leave. Even better, use a zip tie to hold down the trigger on the electric drill so they think you're still down there doing something while you're making your way back to town. At Carrie's house, she reviews Widner's books and realizes the agent was right. She calls Deputy Jordan and tells her she's found a bunch of Widner's hidden accounts. She tries to call Robert, who can't reach him. Back at the cabin, Robert threatens to destroy all the money unless Sterling and Dooley leave. He offers to leave them some money if they return in a couple of hours. Sterling reloads his revolver and fires three shots randomly into the floor, nearly hitting Dooley. Robert sets another 20 grand on fire, accidentally coming within reach of Dooley through the floor grate. Dooley yanks him off his feet and slams him into the crawlspace ceiling. Robert grabs the drill and turns it on. Sterling yanks Dooley out of the way as the drill pierces the floor where Dooley's groin just was. Then Sterling decides to call in reinforcements. Talking is more of a liability at this point than a strategy, unless you know where both bandits are above you. Even if you do decide to talk, you should always have a weapon on hand, like the box cutter he used to cut Dooley's hand earlier, or a drill or hammer, so you can punish them if they grab you. What Robert could have tried is trapping Dooley here. If he had tricked Dooley into reaching through the floor grate, he could have used the drill to screw Dooley's hand to the underside of the floor. This would force Sterling into a corner. Either he has to abandon Dooley to retaliate, or he has to risk his own hand and reaching in to help him. It's likely he would fire into the great hole either way, but again, it's a perfect distraction to get them focused on this area while you race away into the woods. As for the robbers, these two idiots make Zoolander look like a criminal mastermind. This is a cabin in the woods, owned by a lumber mill guy. Are you telling me there isn't an axe anywhere around here that they could use to chop through this wooden floor and access the crawl space from here? They could at least be looking for one. At this point, they've been here for like four hours. Even a fireplace poker could crack open the floorboards in that amount of time. It's just pathetic at this point. Back in town, Deputy Jordan swings by Carrie's house. Carrie wants to go to Whitner's cabin because she knows Robert is there. The deputy says she's heading that way to question Whitner, and they drive off together. Time passes. Dooley suddenly notices a double barrel shotgun hanging above the fireplace. Dooley hunts around and finds five shotgun shells, which he tosses haphazardly at Sterling. Sterling loads the gun, and they head outside. After they leave, Robert reaches through the floor grate and grabs the shotgun shell within reach. At the police station, Agent Masseur and Sheriff Hagen question Gerald. Gerald admits to being part of a skeleton crew that cuts down a couple of old growth trees and drops them off at Widner's Mill where they're paid in oxycotton pills. Outside the cabin, Sterling hooks up a hose to a gas valve. He hobbles over and feeds the tube into one of the crawl space's ventilation grates. Robert holds his breath and yanks a pipe open along the crawl space ceiling, which he uses as an oxygen feed, taking quick breaths when he needs them. Sterling grows impatient. He lights a bit of moss on fire and feeds it through the ventilation grate. Robert narrowly grabs the duffel of cash and wraps himself in a blanket along the far wall. The gas ignites, filling the crawl space with flame and blowing the hatch open. Maybe the drugs are to blame for Sterling's total lack of consideration here. He's only here for the money. There won't be any if he blows it up. He already knows that Robert has done something, like pour paint thinner on the money to light it on fire and make it more difficult to put out. That means the last thing Sterling wants to do here is blow up the crawl space with the money inside. This is pure hot-headed idiocy and in a scenario where Robert doesn't have a fire-resistant blanket, he's dead, the money's gone, and both the robbers walk away empty-handed. Robert's obvious concern concern here is being trapped in a crawl space that's slowly filling up with gas. This tank Sterling and Dooley open is likely a 500 gallon propane tank, meaning that at peak fullness, it's holding 400 gallons of propane gas. One gallon of propane can take up to 35.65 cubic meters of space, so 400 gallons of gas could fill 14,260 cubic feet, much more than this small cabin's crawl space and enough to kill Robert and start a nasty fire at the first flick of a lighter or a torch. Robert 
has a couple of options here. The first would be to quietly stay by the grate where Sterling feeds the hose, and then redirect the end of the hose back to a lower grate, enough so the gas passes out into the lawn without Sterling noticing. This would stop us from suffocating and keep Sterling from setting the crawlspace air on fire. He could also cork the end of the hose with dirt or tie a tight knot in the hose itself. Sterling sends Dooley into the crawlspace with a shotgun, warning him there can't be any loose ends. Dooley fires off a shot, narrowly missing Robert. Robert darts across a narrow passage just as Dooley fires the second shot, missing him again. Pissed off at getting shot at, Robert takes iron scrap and duct tapes it between his fingers like a scrapyard wolverine, then darts into a far corner, barely ducking another shotgun blast. Dooley pursues Robert. Robert ambushes him and knocks the gun away. He gets Dooley on the ground, but when he goes to hit him with his iron claws, they get caught on a house beam, and Dooley knocks him through a wall. If Robert had a bit more Kevin McAllister prep time down here, he could have rigged his torch to set off a booby trap as Dooley entered the hatch. Dooley would drop the shotgun, which we could pick up to finish Sterling off, while Dooley's running around like an idiot with his head on fire. The strongest defensive spot in this crawl space is actually the opening, because it forces intruders into a narrow, restrictive space with little maneuverability. It's why medieval castles invested in murder holes above their front gates, where they could pour boiling water over the heads of their enemies. When Dooley enters with the shotgun, he reaches in with the shotgun first. This would have been the perfect time to crouch to the side and wrench the gun out of his wounded hands before hitting him over the head with a wrench or pipe when he stumbled forward onto the ground. Then, we could have used his fat body as a shield as we fire at Sterling through the hatch. The Wolverine claws look cool if you're fighting in a backyard brawl, but in a life or death fight, they disperse the force of your punch too much. They're unwieldy, and they're more likely to get caught on things like low-hanging ceilings. There's also no need for them when you could go full Paul Bunyan with a giant giant wrench. Dooley calls out to Sterling that he killed Robert, just as Robert leaps on him from behind and strangles Dooley with a piece of loose internet cord. It only incapacitates him. Dooley begins to whimper. Robert finds zip ties and restrains him. He goes for Dooley's gun, but it's broken. When he tosses it down, he sees a pipe laying nearby. Robert goes to work with his tools, the shotgun shell, and the bolt from his shoulder and fashions a pipe rifle. A quick and easy way to double check whether a shotgun is actually broken is to break it open, put your finger over the firing pin hole, and pull the trigger. If you feel the firing pin hit your finger, it still works, at which point you could feed your remaining shotgun shell into the gun and shoot Sterling down from the darkness of the open hatch. Even if the gun is broken, Sterling doesn't know that, so you could also try holding him at gunpoint and getting him to toss his gun. Of course, he's a hothead, so that's risky. He may fire anyways. As for the pipe rifle, YouTube won't let me tell you how to make one one of those, but it can be an effective weapon if you know how to build one. Deputy Jordan and Carrie arrive to the cabin. Finally, the deputy pulls her weapon and rounds the cabin as Sterling appears. She snaps at Sterling that he messed up her plan, saying Robert is just a plumber and it should have been easy to grab the cash and run. Sterling counters that Robert must be ex-military. She puts her gun away, which Carrie notices. When the sheriff calls out over the radio, Carrie responds and tells him and Agent Masseur to hurry to the Whitner cabin. Jordan says she'll handle this, goes to the patrol car, and pulls Carrie out to use as a bargaining tool. Jordan insults Sterling and gets a bullet to the back with her own gun. Sterling grabs Carrie and calls out to Robert. Let's pause for a quick second to play the bad guy here. Deputy Jordan is in the perfect position to get everything she wants right here in this 15 second scene. You know how? Instead of berating Sterling for a bad job, she should ask him to pull out his weapon, and when he does, she should shoot him between the eyes. At that point, she would look like a hero, like she shot him while he was drawing his weapon to fire. She could call out to Robert that everything is safe now, let him reunite with Carrie, and shoot them both down with Sterling's gun. At that point, she could either run with the money, or hide the money and wait for backup to arrive, claiming Carrie was killed in the crossfire after Sterling shot Robert, and she shot Sterling. The stuff is too easy. As it is, maybe wait until you're both free and clear before slinging insults at people you know are hot-headed and just lost their brother. To be honest though, Deputy Jordan didn't need Dooley and Sterling in the first place. She knew Whitner was timber poaching. Why not just wait until she knows Whitner isn't home and search the place herself? If she's caught, she can make an excuse for being there, like she heard a scream or she took shelter inside because a bear wandered by. As for Sterling, he's hopelessly stupid. All he needed to do was wait until after Robert and Carrie were dead to kill Jordan, and he could have walked into the sunset with a full duffel bag. If Heath Ledger's Joker taught me anything, it's don't kill your criminal crew until after they've delivered the goods to you. Robert suddenly appears with a bag of cash. He says he soaked the bag in paint thinner and says he'll torch it if Sterling kills Carrie. As the standoff drags on, Robert finally turns off the torch. He throws the duffel at Sterling, who tosses Carrie away to cash 
hatchet. Suddenly from behind, Sheriff Hagen shoots Sterling in the leg, and before Sterling can react, Robert fires his pipe rifle, spearing Sterling through the throat with the crossbow bolt. In his last moments, Sterling raises his gun again, and Robert knocks him out with a massive wrench. There's too many variables at play here to leave this moment to chance or the arrival of a police officer who can ex machina a bullet into the bad guy's leg. When Robert throws the bag, he should immediately strike Sterling in the head with his wrench, get him on the ground, and then hit him several more times before taking his gun. The pipe rifle, while awesome, takes a long moment to fire, giving Sterling enough time to potentially shoot him or Carrie before he can be subdued. In a moment like this, the brute solution is probably the best. Deputy Jordan is arrested, and Robert goes home to his family. Suddenly, all his his unpaying clients seem all too happy to pay off their tabs. As a final token of appreciation, the sheriff pops by with a portion of the duffel bag money for Robert to keep. There were plenty of ways to end this standoff before it even began, so I think the timber poachers in Crawl Space were beaten. <laughs>